move it right across to, to Fraser. Mm -hmm. Fraser from uh, the, the senior fellow at um, McKinsey Global Institute, done lots of work on resource efficiency and work with companies as well as governments. Uh, let's give us your, mm -hmm. your comments, please. Sure. Um, and first of all, thank you um, for inviting me and, and thank you to Karen and Alberto for what I think is a very useful paper and, and uh, a very useful contribution to the discussion. Um, I, I think it's important to, to see this paper in the, in the broader context and James alluded this, uh, to this in his opening remarks. The basis of competitiveness for both firms and, and countries has changed and it's changed at a transformational rate. If you just look back in the, the past century, the, the rules of competitiveness were that you have to get more labour productivity because labour was the, the most important cost um, input and it was also the one that was increasing in price. If you compare that to natural resource prices, over the course of the last century, resource prices fell. And they didn't just fall by little, they halved. And so quite naturally, firms and countries were optimising on the things that were scarce. Now, you look at the situation we face today, and in addition to the climate mitigation concerns that we face, the, just looking at the resource lens of this, that situation is more than reversed. And resource prices have more than doubled over the past 10 years, and now at an all-time high. And this is a fundamental challenge for business models to catch up with this because of the speed of change that we've seen. And particularly so given the failures that are in the, the, the market environment today. So the fact, as we alluded to, we don't have an effective carbon price. We don't price other externalities. Um, we don't have supply chains that are ready. And we've got price signals which are incredibly volatile and make it very hard for business to react at the, the scale it needs. And so when you look at what's happening in business and across a range of different sectors in, in which we serve, we see that a lot of companies are failing to properly understand the potential impact that this changing competitiveness could have on their, um, their business operations. And we've typically looked at four different transmission channels um, of how this affects sectors. Uh, one is on the, the resource inputs. And just to take one example, if you look at the food and beverage industry, uh, the inputs have increased at a far greater rate um, than the ability for them to pass that on to consumers, and particularly now so in the economic downturn. And so they've effectively had to sort of swallow that, that margin. If you look at supply chain risks, there's a huge amount of supply chain risk that businesses are facing, particularly with these just-in-time operations. Um, and one example I, I shared with uh, James and Karen earlier was the fact that the increasing interlinkages between resources makes supply chain risks even harder to navigate. And the example I gave was in, in oil and gas. Um, increasingly, oil and gas is coming from offshore sources, and that uses much more steel per barrel of oil. And in fact, the amount of steel per barrel of oil is increased four times. If we look where that steel comes from, iron ore is a major component. And when you look at where iron ore projects are coming, 40% uh, of those are in water-scarce regions. And if you follow that so far, it keeps going a bit further when you look at the major demand for water in those regions is agriculture. And part of the biggest impact on agriculture is phosphates, which 80% of them are located in Morocco. So suddenly, if you're a, an oil and gas executive, you're not just worrying about um, steel anymore, you're worrying about this whole supply chain links. And this just isn't a, a, a theoretical academic debate. Um, a lot of our clients are fundamentally concerned about this uh, and have started to form partnerships between companies in different industries that would never typically collaborate um, because they realise they can't mitigate these concerns on their own. Now, when you shift to countries, uh, we, we have taken a slightly different lens. Um, and this is maybe one of the, the challenges I would, I would give the team here is that rather than looking at sectors, we look at what we call resource productivity opportunities. And some of these cut across sectors. Um, and these include everything from like building energy efficiency, for example, and building is obviously used across different sectors, uh, and use steel efficiency, which is using automotive construction and so forth. So a lot of these productivity opportunities are very sort of cross-cutting and perhaps a, a different lens by which countries can define competitiveness. Uh, we did a report in 2011 uh, called The Resource Revolution, and we, in that report, we found that there's 180 productivity opportunities across water, land, energy, and steel that um, were particularly important um, in, in countries, and 70% of those were in developing countries. Um, we found in particular that 15 of those really matter. And so since then, we've been trying to track performance to understand how countries are performing on this and who's accelerating and what can we learn from that. Uh, and we plan to publish this a bit uh, later this year. But some of the preliminary findings we found are quite interesting, that performance varies widely um, between different countries. 
uh, and quite substantially. If you take food waste, for example, just looking at the supply chain, in Latin American countries, they have double the amount of food waste in the value chain than they do in North America. If you take oil recovery, and I know we're not talking low-income countries um, with these particular examples, but it does apply more broadly, Saudi Arabia recovers half the amount of oil as does Norway. And the other interesting aspect we found is that in many cases, developing countries are in the lead. Um, Mexico, for example, their uh, gas, uh, gas plants are more energy efficient than Japan and Germany, which is quite extraordinary when you consider the changes in both those countries. Um, if you look at LED lighting, it's China that's in the lead here in terms of overall penetration. So a lot of the lessons are actually coming from the low income and developing countries around resource efficiency. Um, and the, the broader lessons, just to give you, a, a, I guess, a high level message of that that we found is that the, the how always varies from, from context to context. Um, but there's some underlying lessons of um, the political economy side of how this gets done. And we found particularly where the, the lessons of best practice was that you had often one figure who was central to this. So in, Cambo in Cambodia's water reforms, they had a, a, a charismatic um, and energetic leader who was spurring the, the drive for reducing water leakage in Phnom Penh. Um, we also see a real focus on behavioural change. Um, and we focus a lot as economists naturally on the prices and everything else, and behavioural change is not something we often feel comfortable dealing with because we, we don't normally have the toolkit. But you see there a lot of emphasis on things like role modelling, uh, like Morocco was a great example, their agricultural reforms, they started with pilots, proved the case to farmers, and then got them to roll it out more broadly. The same thing is happening in Ethiopia at the moment. Um, so we think there's a lot of tangible lessons there, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave just the, the team with a couple of thoughts. And one is, when we come to the country level, is it right to still be looking at sectors versus these things? Um, and then secondly, on the, the business case, um, I think one thing that makes this really powerful is when we can take these different trends and communicate it in a way that shows them uh, why they should be concerned. And, and we often talk about value at risk as a percentage of profits. Um, and I know the numbers are hard, but the more we can get it in that kind of language, the more I think this will really start to shift the debate. Um, so I think there's an important contribution and I, I, I hope um, this can progress it to the level it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fraser. A really nice linkage at the end there too between proper analysis of risk and investment space, where, where are the opportunities for investment that might be deployed in a different manner in order to improve uh, economic development in these countries. And lots of good examples from, uh, uh, from the emerging markets, lots of standards set there rather than uh, necessarily in the developed world and exported from there.